Well, if you have a copy of God's Word, would you turn to the book of Jude, the book of Jude. We're going to look in verse 17 this morning, verse 17 to 23, and then next week we'll end our series in verse 24 and 25, the Lord willing, uh, and the book of Jude as we're continuing to look together. While you're turning there, I want to continue to encourage you. I want to uh, just celebrate 1,541 steps have been taken so far as we go towards our living authentically, biblically, connectedly, desperately, evangelistically, and faithful. What does it look like to live a transformed life? Life And so I want to encourage you, keep putting those rocks in there, keep making those steps. It's encouraging to your staff to see us go over 1,500, and I certainly pray we get over 2,000 by the time the year is up. And again, it's not a legalistic thing. We're checking our chart. It's just a matter of us celebrating together the different steps that we're taking to grow in our transformation as our lives are designed and called to look more like Christ Jesus. Now in Jude, we're talking about contending for the faith. And this morning's title of the message is entitled this, A Winning Strategy for Fighting. Now we don't often talk about it in this way anymore because it seems a little bit harsh. And, uh, but there are some great hymns of the faith that we talk about, all more Christian soldiers. And a lot of things that talk about the spiritual warfare of which we are encountering on a daily basis. The challenge for many of us is realizing and recognizing that we are in that battle that if we've claimed the name of Christ, that we've accepted Christ our Lord and Savior, we're followers of Jesus, we're in the fight. We're called to contend for the faith. And so Jude, in his continuing conversation with those that he was writing to, to encourage, lays out three clear truths of how we can fight a winning strategy, how to contend and win for the faith. We are in a battle that's being waged every single day day, right? Every single day against the truth and the gospel of Christ Jesus, both outside the culture and even inside the church itself. In our calling here, Jude says, is we have to win these battles. Now, Jude didn't want them, nor does he want us to become spiritual casualties. So he urges them and he urges us to stand up and fight to win When we're talking about winning, we need to know what we mean by winning because what the world's definition of winning and what the Bible says winning perhaps are two different things. Winning means this, that we are contending for the faith. That we're not sitting idly by, that we're doing nothing about walking with Christ, that we're not speaking the truth in love, that we're standing firm on the word of God. It means that we're contending for the faith. It means we win. What does it mean to contend for the faith? It means we lovingly and obediently walk with the Lord, sharing and living the truth with those around us, not shirking back or compromising our faith, but instead standing unwavering, unwavering on God's truth. And listen, and that our lives and our words back up that truth. It actually reflects the fact that we are being transformed. Now, it doesn't mean we're perfect, right? We're going to make mistakes. We're going we're gonna to mess up. There's going to be problems along the way, right? We know that. But that our course of our life, the trajectory of our life is that we're being transformed. That's the best way we contend for the faith. Now, the reality is sometimes that's easier said than done. So Jude gives them some reminders of how to fight and how to contend for the faith, which means ultimately we need desperately the Lord's spiritual discernment to be able to clearly see in what sometimes in our world and in our lives can sometimes seem muddy, can sometimes seem hard to grasp, can sometimes seem hard to grab a hold of, if you will. But be able to clearly see and differentiate between right and wrong so that we can pursue the gospel and flee from the wrong things. So Jude's going to lay out three truths here in verses 17 to 23. Let me invite you to stand together in the honor of reading of God's word together. And here's what it says in verse number 17. But you, beloved, ought to remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. That they were saying to you in the last time there will be mockers following after their own ungodly lust. These are ones who cause divisions. Worldly minded, devoid of the spirit. But you, beloved, there it is again, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life and have mercy on some who are doubting, save others, snatching them out of the fire, and on some have mercy with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. 
Father, I pray, Lord, by these words that you would speak to every heart in life, beginning with mine first. Lord, that we would hear these three truths that Jude wrote thousands of years ago that we need to hear today, October of 2024. So God, may we open our hearts for you to speak to us. May we open our ears to listen. May we have feet that are willing to respond to that which you call us to do. May we not shirk back from that responsibility or that calling or that change or whatever it is you call us to do. May we do it in obedience to you. May we contend for the faith. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I want to talk about these three truths this morning. Verses 17 to 19, we see right out of the gate that Jude wants them to remember the solid foundation of their faith. The key word here throughout these three truths is the word faith, the gospel, what we base our lives on, what the word of God teaches to be the gospel of Christ Jesus. And he calls them dear friends. I love when he addresses that. Sometimes Paul writes, when he writes some of his letters, it's kind of scathing, but here, and sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's in this same vein where Jude's writing and saying, my beloved, I love you in the Lord. You are special objects of God's love. And he says that to them, beloved, I want you to remember a couple of things. They're very, very important things. I need you to remember them so that they won't catch you by surprise. Now, sometimes some of us love surprises. Some of you, man, you love surprises. You love like a surprise birthday party, a surprise trip. You love surprises. Sometimes they're kind of, you like scary surprises, right? How many of you love scary surprises? You love to be scared and surprised. How many of you like that kind of stuff, okay? Good, about four of you. All right, great. So not all of you like that. How many of you like a surprise something, anything, like you back to be surprised? Okay, good. Got a couple of hands, a couple of honest hands. How many of you absolutely hate being surprised on any and every level? Look, okay. We got a lot of OCD folks like me, the control people, right? Don't like to be surprised. Why? Because it means what? We're out of control, right? We don't know what's going to happen, right? I'm good to be on the other side. I'm good to help some, surprise somebody else. No problem. That is not an issue, right? I love being on this side of it, but I don't want to be on that side. So, but what Jude wants him to know is, so listen, so that you're not on that side of being surprised, here's what I want you to know to be, to be reminded, so that you don't go, gosh, I never realized that. That's just shocking. I can't believe that to be the case. He says, remember the solid foundation of your faith. Three things. Number one, remember about your faith who said it. Remember who said it. For us, it's very clear. We have God's entire word. For Jude's listeners, in particular, it was the words of the apostles and the Old Testament. It was the very clear authority, not some random person or even a teacher or some counterfeit of the 12 disciples, but instead it was those 12 disciples or apostles. Those were where they were getting their teaching from, maybe including obviously Paul and perhaps Barnabas and James, the brother of Jesus. These that were in authority speaking the truth of the word of God. You got to remember who said it because that really dictates what you believe to be true. Because there were false teachers who were claiming authority. And so Jude wanted to remind them, here's your litmus test. Here's how you know if what you're hearing is true or not. Did it come from the lips and from the mouths and from the words of these 12 and plus a couple of other apostles? Remember when the church gathered to decide what would go into the New Testament, the book had to be either written by an apostle in the New Testament or closely associated with an apostle. So it was the test of truth. So he says, remember, first of all, who wrote it. So if I'm going to contend for my faith, i got to remember who wrote God's Word. These were men inspired by God through the power of the Holy Spirit who gave us these words. It was the words that God intended us for, to us to have. So i got to remember who, who said it. Number two, in our case, we're, God says it, right? We know. Uh, number two, reflect on what they said. Reflect on what they said. False teachers would arise, Jude warns them. He reminds him, listen, in verse 17, he tells them, right? He says right there, listen, in verse 18, rather, he says they were saying in the last time there will be mockers. There will be false teachers who will say the wrong things. And the proof that Jude was true is these false teachers were actually already on the scene. There will be those who would deny God's word. He will say, well, that's not really what God meant. That's not really what God said. I mean, I know that's what you think it means, but that's not really what God meant. There will be those who would come and mock God's word, as we'll talk about in a moment. Because why? They didn't want anyone telling them how to live their life and contradict the lifestyle they were living. Sometimes we can be that way as well. 
Number three, recognize the false teachers. Remember who said it, right? Number two, reflect on what they said. That's critical. Number three, uh, reflect on what they said. Number three, recognize the false teachers in verse 19. Right? Verse into verse 18, they follow after their own godly lust. These are the ones who cause division, worldly-minded, devoid of the Spirit. So recognize these false teachers. Now, this is really critical because we know the last five of verses 5 through 16, he's laid that out. So here he almost kind of summarizes. So he won't spend a lot of time here, but he summarizes what to look for in these false teachers. Before we jump there, though, let me read a scripture from Paul about this same idea in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He says this, But what I am doing I will continue to do so that I may cut off opportunity from those who desire an opportunity to be regarded just as we were in the matter about which they are boasting. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workers. Watch this, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. They didn't act like they were somebody out from the outside. We we were apostles of Christ. No wonder, watch this, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it is not surprising. Don't be shocked if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness whose end will be according to their deeds. So he tells them here a couple of things here about what to look for. Number one, they disparage the Lord. They mock the Lord. They make fun of those who follow the Lord, ridicule, spout off cynical jabs and contrary opinions to the truth of the word of God. They would say that Jesus wasn't going to return. They would make light of God's holiness and his moral perfection and the calling that we have. Now, if you've been here for a while, you know that 2 Peter and Jude closely follow together. And so let us look at 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 to 4, which echo this same truth. Know this, first of all, that in the last days, by the way, when are the last days? Today, right? We're living in the last days. We've been living in the last days since Christ ascended into heaven, and we're one day closer today than we were yesterday to the return of Christ. But in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts, and saying, watch this, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. The disciples, many of them thought that Christ would return in their lifetime. <coughs> we see other writers and pastors and teachers throughout the centuries that thought that Christ was going to come in their lifetime for various kinds of reasons. And he hasn't come. And so in Jude's day, just like maybe perhaps today, it's been 2,000 years. When is he going to return? What is he waiting on? And so we hear those that would say, well, it's been the same thing since the beginning of time. Nothing's changed. That's what these false teachers and mockers would say. Where is the promise of his coming? They mock goodness and morality and obedience to the Lord. By the way, it's a lot easier for someone to make fun of your beliefs then deal with your beliefs. To actually understand and maybe even accept them, it's a lot easier to make fun of you for why you believe what you believe rather than owning up to where somebody might be in their life. Because remember, there's a day coming where we'll have to answer for how we lived our lives. Number two, they cause division. They Not only disparage the Lord, they cause division inside the church. This word means making a distinction. They were saying this. How do they divide? They simply said, well, we have special spiritual knowledge. And the others that are with us, we're far superior than you because we know something that you don't know. Listen, let me give you a word of encouragement. If somebody stands in this pulpit and never tells you they know something that you don't, your ears ought to perk up like a dog ready to hunt a squirrel. Okay? That was for you, Caleb. You're welcome. No charge. Right? Right? Your ears ought to be like, what did he just say? Because guess what? You have the whole counsel of the word of God. The Bible says nothing is hidden. You can know the truth for yourself. So maybe some of you are saying to yourself, then why am I listening to you? Because <laughs> the Bible tells us we gather together and worship. We study God's word together. Those that have been maybe equipped and called to help expound and break open the word of God even further. Listen, that's what they were saying. I know more than you, though, so I'm better than you. And it put them into two different camps, which caused what? Division. 
You know what Satan loves inside of a church? He loves it. Division. He loves disunity. He loves disharmony. That's his goal. Listen, a church divided can never stand, and it must be unified if it is to withstand any attack from without or even from within. Which means what? How does that happen? It means we have to be spiritually humble. We put the needs of others before ourselves. Number three, they delight in evil desires. They are worldly minded, some of your translations may say. They follow after their own ungodly lust. They were interested, they were not interested rather, or focused on anything spiritual but the natural, the flesh, the things of the world that we unpack over the last several weeks together. They were sensual and ungodly people, the opposite of spiritual, chasing the wrong thing. Charles Swindoll says this, once a person breaks free from the safety harness of God's word, they plummet in a free fall of depravity, descending toward destruction. We have to be careful. These false teachers and even these things can creep into our lives where we can cause division or we delight in our evil desires. Lastly, they are devoid of the Spirit, Jude says. What does that mean? It means they lack the presence of the Holy Spirit. And as a result, listen very carefully, if they didn't have the Holy Spirit in their lives, they weren't true believers. Because we know this to be true. The Bible teaches us that when we ask Christ into our heart and life, the Holy Spirit comes at that moment, fills us completely. We get all of Jesus that we're ever, ever going to get. Now, some say, what about the verse that says be filled with the Holy Spirit on a daily basis? We pray to that. What do we mean by that? Well, we mean that daily I'm submitting myself to the the power and the authority of the Holy Spirit in my life. I want to be aware of God's fullness because I'm filled to the brim as a follower of Jesus. But here he was saying these false teachers, they are not. Romans 8, 9 says if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Right? They wouldn't, as a result, welcome the things of the Spirit or the conviction that he would bring about the truth of God's Word. They were simply empty people filled with only the stuff of the world. They were what we might call a religious fraud. They paid lip service to the faith and spiritual life, but they denied Christ by their actions. Listen to what Titus 1 verse 16 says. They profess to know God, but their deeds, they deny him being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. I can profess to know God. I can say those words. Listen, we talk to people, and I talk to people about, do you believe in in God? And they say, well, yes. But the Bible says even the demons believe and shudder. Satan believes in God. But by their deeds, by their words, by their actions, they deny him. They were devoid of the Holy Spirit. So if I'm going to contend for the faith, I must, number one, start with remembering the solid foundation of my faith. Remember who said what. Reflect on what they said. And number three, be able to recognize the false teachers. Let it not surprise you. Number two, build yourselves up in the faith. Build yourselves up in the faith. In order for us to be on guard, to be ready, to be prepared to fight the battles that might lay in front of us, we each need to build ourselves up in the faith. Meaning what? We've got to know God's word, his teaching, and be committed to that. The word of God has been passed on to us through generation after generation, something that we have received. We didn't make it up ourselves like other cults and world religions. They were handed down by God the Father himself. So we are standing today, listen, on a clear, solid foundation, the rock. We stand amazed today in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. We do that corporately, but here Paul is, or Jude is referring to things that we must do specifically individually. It means I've got to be committed to grow and be willing and want to do the work that it takes to grow. To have those spiritual disciplines as a part of our lives. Reading his word, praying, memorizing, journaling, fasting, all these things that are a part of that. It means that as a result of that, I'm living authentically, biblically, connectedly, desperately, evangelistically, and faithfully. Somebody said it this way, we can't contend for a faith that we do not know ourselves. Kent Hughes said it this way, you can't be profoundly influenced by that which you do not know. I can talk about it all day long, but until I've walked it and I've lived it, it's not the same. We have to build up our faith, grow in it daily, no matter how long you've been a follower of Jesus. I was counting up, and 
conversation last week about and this, it's not next week, but the next week, November the 7th. Oh, it's kind of hard for me to imagine. It took my breath away when I thought about it. How many of you, this is going to make me feel so old, but I just want to do it just around. How many of you are 44 and younger? Raise your hand. 44 and younger. Raise your hand. Okay, good. That's great. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. I've been a Christian longer than you've been alive. Praise the Lord. Does that make you feel better about yourself? Does not feel good? You think you're over the hill? No, you're not. You're not. I celebrate that, though. I was, I was saying that. I was like, holy cow, that's hard to believe. And so that means that I've got to have learned everything that there is to know about the Bible. Sweet Miss Wilma sitting right there, 93 years old, so proud, able to be here this morning. Miss Wilma would tell you, without hesitation, she's not learned everything about the Word of God. She's been a believer a long, long time. She knows a lot of more things about the Lord than I do. But you know what she'll tell you? She's still learning. Because we have to grow for our entire lives. We never stop growing. So I've got to build myself in the faith. Three ways that I do that. Number one, he says I'm called to pray. Pray in the Holy Spirit. It means I have to be desperate, which is why it's part of our living a transformed life. That's what this is so critical for us, is I have to come to a place where I realize without the Lord, I, am, I have no hope. I must live desperately and dependently on Him. The essence of what it means to follow Christ is an admission, listen to this, of our total and complete dependence upon Him. And the way that I know that is I pray. That unlocks the door to my dependence of saying to the Lord and having that conversation with the Lord and access to the power that I do not have. Charles Swindoll again says this, when we pray, we start in weakness, but we end in God's strength. We begin with nothing, but he gives us everything. We come empty, but he fills us. Elsewhere in God's word, it talks about praying. Look at what it says, Ephesians 6, 18. What does it say? With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. We're called to pray. The next one. Philippians 4, 6, be anxious for nothing, but in, watch this, circle this word, everything. Here's another Greek translation for you. Ready for this? This is awesome. I studied hard for this one. You know what the word everything means in Greek? You ready for it? What does it mean? Everything. Wait, wait, but not, not exclude a few things, like not, not a, a couple things, but God's not interested in hearing. No, no, no. In everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the last one. This is a short verse. This is a good one if you memorize. You want to memorize. I memorize the verse of the Bible. Pray without ceasing. What does that mean? It means pray all the time. It means I don't just reserve it for a church service or just a meal maybe or maybe the morning or the evening. I pray throughout my day. I can even pray in a worship service even as I'm singing. I'm praying. I'm having communication with the Lord, praying to him and listening we pray in the Holy Spirit. Why? Because he's the one who guides us and directs us. He's the one who convicts us. He's the one who interprets our prayers to the Father. He's the one who prays when we can't and don't even know what to pray. When we're so broken and so humbled and so repentant and we're so sorrowful or we're so broken of what's happening in our lives or some horrible thing we're struggling with and we don't even know what to pray, the Bible says the Spirit intercedes for us. I love this statement. S.D. Gordon, a devotional writer in the latter part of the 19th and early 20th century, said this. Listen, listen to this. You can do more than pray after you've prayed. But you cannot do more than pray until you have prayed. Let, let me read that one again. You can do more than pray after you've prayed. But you cannot do more than pray until you have prayed. We must pray if we're going to grow in our foundation. Number two, we must remain, keep ourselves, the Bible says, in God's love. Verse 21a says we must remain in his love, which means I have to make a choice. I have to decide, will I stay here in Christ's love or will I wander and go my own way? Now, by the way, our human nature, mine at the top of the list, is very prone to wonder. We sing that wonderful hymn of old. We sing it here from time to time. Lord, my heart is prone to wander. I feel it. Bind my wandering heart to thee. The writer knew what we know is that our hearts can be easily off track. Led away into the wrong thing. 
So he says we must choose to remain where? Watch this. In the Lord's love. It's not a bad thing. Satan would make it out to be it's a horrible thing. We're in this horrible place. And we need to come over here where it's better and more enjoyable. And it's over here. And God says, no, stay over here. You want to stay over here in my love. Stay right here. He told his disciples in John 15, if you'll abide in me, I'll abide in you. Remain in God's love. We're already loved by him, but we need to stay there. Look at what John, he said in John 15, 9, verse 11. Just as the Father has loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. Dwell there. Stay there. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandment and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you. Why? Oh, listen to this. So that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made what? Full. Complete. What is he saying? He wants to expose the lie of the enemy, Jesus is. The enemy says, come over here. This is where joy is. This is where happiness is. But Jesus says, listen, if you'll abide in me and you'll keep my commandments, not so that you can earn your salvation, but because you are saved, because you love me, you will follow my words and my teachings. And if you'll do that and stay within these safe boundaries, not to restrict you, but to give you what? Joy. Oh, I love that. Satan loves to hide these verses from our minds, doesn't he? This over here looks so much better and so much easier and so much more fun. But yet God says, if you'll remain here, this is where the circle of joy is. Remain in God's love. If I'm going to build that foundation in my faith, I've got to pray. I've got to remain in God's love. And as I do that, the natural outflow of my life, guess what? It's obedience. I want to stay in the sphere of God's blessing. I want to live close to him. I want to experience his incredible and overwhelming love. We know it to be true. There is no better place to be than in the center of God's love and his will for our lives. For there is where, gosh, that's so good. That is where joy is found. Some of us need to hear that this morning. It's not over here. It's right here. It's right in front of you. Number three, the last one, wait expectantly for Christ's return. Wait expectantly. Wait with earnest expectation and with certainty and conviction that Christ is coming. We should be watching for it. Now, he uses the word anxiously here. We hear that word. We're like, that's not good. Nobody wants to be anxious. It says, don't be anxious about anything. What do we mean by that? It's a sense of anticipation. It's like a, a, a child anticipating Christmas morning. They're anxiously awaiting, Right? It's not very far away, kiddos, right? For some of you, you're going to go to bed that, oh, that longest night of all, Christmas Eve. I can remember doing it as a kid. I anxiously waited for that morning to come. He calls us. Get, get this now. This is a great illustration. Didn't, didn't think about this till just this moment. We're called to anticipate Christ's return with that same kind of expectancy and joy and hope times a million. When's the last time you stop and let your heart think about Christ's return? When's the last time you let it influence how you live your life? The hope that it brings. Titus 2 verse 13 says, Our blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Knowing what awaits us at the end should motivate us to live here and now for him. Our eyes should be heavenward, fixed on Jesus Christ and the promise and the prize of his return. And listen, if, even if he doesn't return in our lifetime, which he may or may not, we don't know. There's a day coming, friend. There's a day coming when the Lord will make all things new. When we'll leave this earth and it's sin, sick, filled world and we will be in the presence of Jesus Christ for eternity and if you know Christ is Savior and Lord listen you're there to receive mercy and not judgment dear friend let me just give you a side note if you don't know Christ as Savior and Lord you can know how to experience that mercy today before you leave that you wouldn't have to wait in a negative sense of anxiously but in a positive sense Number three, lastly, as we wrap it up this morning, 
Remember the solid foundation of your faith. Build yourselves up in your faith. And thirdly, reach those inside and outside of the faith. Now these are some challenging verses here, but they're needed and necessary for us. Verse 22 and 23, he gives three different categories of those of how we need to reach those who are outside or maybe inside the faith, but they've struggled, they're slipping, they've fallen. Here's what it tells us. We need to be looking around and taking notice. If we're going to contend for the faith, it means we've got to contend for the lives of those we care about. And maybe even some of those that you may not even know that have been deceived or misled or wounded by false teachers and those who have led them astray. Some might ask, well, listen, I'm going to heaven, man. Good luck for them. I hope it turns out well, which is never what Christ called us to do. Three different groups, he tells us what we need to do. Number one, we need to show mercy on those who doubt. Show mercy on those who doubt. Jude identifies there were some who were simply confused, wavering, or even doubting. Guess what? Some of us have been there in our own lives before. They were, try- they were wavering between the difference between what the false teachers were saying and what Jude and the apostles were saying. So what do we do for folks that are struggling and they're doubting? We don't throw stones at them. We show mercy and love and have great patience and understanding. We don't shun them or reject them or ignore them, but we must be willing to speak up the truth with compassion and conviction, kindness and firmness, mercy and concern, contend for the faith for those who may doubt. Not just merely point out the wrong with the false teaching that they have heard or even refute the false teachings, but instead lovingly point them to the truth of what God's Word says and point them to Jesus because He has all the answers that they'll ever need. And he is the one that can provide the abundant joy that they're looking for in their life. So maybe there's some in your world, maybe that are struggling with doubt. Show mercy, Jude says. Number two, rescue those who are in danger. Rescue those who are in danger. He goes to a little bit deeper level. They're not just, they're not just doubting. They've gone a little bit further. In fact, the Bible says here they've gotten so close to the edge that their clothes have gotten singed. They're that close. Maybe their eyebrows have been, have been burned. I, I, good friend Stephen Moore talked to funeral home guys regularly. When he first was, they started doing the cremations uh, at the funeral home. About a month later, you look up and Stephen has no eyebrows anymore. I'm like, dude, are you going for a new look? Oh, that's really interesting. He's like, nope, I got clo- too close to the fire. Here's what Jude is meaning. There's some that are so close, so away from the Lord, they've gotten so close over here to the fire, the fires of hell itself, that they've been singed. And here, the Bible says we're called to snatch them out, to rescue them. It's an Old Testament reference. I don't have time to see it in Amos and in Zechariah about someone being snatched out by God's grace, the high priest uh, Joshua, and also the nation of Israel being snatched out of the fire. It echoes the calling in James. James says something similar in James chapter 5, verses 19 to 20. Look at what he says. My brethren, if anyone among you strays from the truth and one turns him back, let him know that the one who turns a sinner from the error of his ways will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Now let me just let you be aware, this is not always easy to do. Because if you're going to go over and rescue some who are getting singed by the fire, you might get burned a little bit too. But it's still our calling to snatch them, to rescue them. And what do we do? Once again, we point them to Jesus. We need to be willing to stand in the gap for people who are on the edge. Oh, C.T. Studd, missionary to Africa in the early 1900s. Listen to what he said. Some Christians want to live within the sound of the church or a chapel bell. I want to run a rescue shop within a yard of hell. Wow. You ever had the joy of watching somebody being rescued and pulled back from the edge? I gotta remind you, it's not the safest place to be, but it's the place where Jesus would be. That's where he was his whole ministry rescuing people that had been singed by the fire and snatched them out. Number three, as we close, carefully show mercy to those who are defiled. 
This is the group that was in the most desperate condition. The other two perhaps were already believers but had wandered away. This last group are those most likely were not believers. And he says with a word of caution, go after these folks to be very careful that you don't get your garments stained. Now here he uses a word, it's kind of gross, but I'll tell you, it's the word for excrement. It's a word for undergarments that were sold. And he says, if you get too close to them, you might experience that as well. So you got to be really careful. Here's the example I'll give you for us to make sense. Any of you ever been a lifeguard before? Anybody need lifeguards in here before? But no, look, several of you have been a lifeguard before. Tell me, just you lifeguard people, what is one of the first things they warn you when you're a lifeguard and you're going to rescue a drowning person? What do they tell you? Tell me. This is audience participation. Be bold. They'll drown you too. You're exactly right. Now, do they mean to drown you? The person's coming to save them. Do they mean to drown you? No. But if you're coming to save me and I'm drowning, I'm going to do all I can to not drown. And if you drown, I hate it, but I'm not going to drown. <laughs> don't you want to be a lot lifeguard, don't you? That's not what I'm saying. That's what pe- Listen, your mind, when they're drowning, they're not thinking clearly, right? They're in a survival mode and you come out to them, you're going to be the hero. And he says, be very careful, someone would teach you. That you make certain you have safety first and be careful. They're going to be in full-blown panic mode and they may unintentionally drown you. We have to be very careful and cautious when we go and grab folks that are so far over the edge that they don't cause us to fall as well. It can easily happen to any of us. I don't care who you are. He gives a word of warning. But let me give you another thought here, though. It is alive, Satan, though, that we have to live like the lost to reach the lost. Listen, this is biblical. You don't have to drink like someone, curse like them, party like them, or be like them in order to reach them. In fact, listen to me carefully, the just the opposite is true. What they need to see from you is a person who doesn't have to have those things and chooses, listen to me carefully, that lives a complete and totally transformed life. Not that you're better than them, not that you're there to judge them, but to show them a different way. That you have experienced joy and purpose and peace in your life, and I don't have to have that. I don't have to go over there to reach them to do that. I might have to go where they are, but I don't have to do what they do in order to win them. I do the exact opposite. William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army. A little different now than what it was in its founding. Oh, it does some great things still today. Listen to what he says. This is powerful about rescuing those from the edge. If I had my way, I would not send my workers to four years of college. If I had my way, I would not send my workers through three years of seminary. If I had my way, I'd put all my workers in hell for five minutes. It'd be the best theological training they'd ever receive. We don't like to think about hell very often. It's uncomfortable. Makes us nervous, gets us anxious, gets us worried. But yet Jesus talked about heaven and hell all the time. And we as the body of Christ know the truth. And we are called to show mercy on those who are having doubt, to snatch those who are out of the fire, and to carefully, with wisdom, go and grab those who've gone completely over the edge and bring them to Jesus. What is it? It's our mission to engage people to go to where they are with the hope of the gospel to see lives transformed. Will we answer the call? Will we contend for the faith by remembering the solid foundation of our faith, by building ourselves up in the faith and reach those inside and outside of the faith? Father, I thank you in Jesus' name for the privilege the opportunity that I have each and every Sunday to stand on this stage. Lord, I do not take it lightly. I know that I'm not worthy to stand on this stage. Nothing about my life makes me worthy. The only thing that makes me worthy is you. 
And so Lord, I come humbly as I know how that I need to walk in these three truths myself. Lord, I pray for some this morning that need us to stop and for a moment and remember the foundation of their faith. For some to remember is something they can't really remember yet because they've never ever trusted you as their Savior and their Lord. And so I pray for some this morning, Lord, that need to make that decision to follow Christ. Lord, I pray they would do that today on this day to admit to you they're a sinner, ask you to forgive them of all their sins, believe that you're the Son of God who loved them and gave yourself for them. They would confess you as their Savior and commit their life to you as Lord. Lord, I pray for someone in the room this morning or maybe watching online who's never made that decision. They would do it today. And they could then move from a place of being concerned about your coming and what would happen to them if they die. But Lord, instead they moved to a place of joy and of love and of peace. Lord, I pray for others still in this room this morning that need to remember, Father, build themselves up in their faith. Maybe they feel weak. Maybe they're struggling in where they are. Maybe they're walking in a difficult circumstance. Lord, they need to build themselves up in you. And how do they do that? Lord, they need to pray to remain in your love. Lord, and to Lord, live our lives with eternity in view. To, Lord, live our lives expectant of your return. That that influences everything we say and everything that we do and how we live our lives. So for some, that might mean I need to come and confess my sin. I may need to come, Lord, and pray for a friend. I may need to come and, and say, Lord, I need to spend more time in your word or in prayer or whatever it is in growing. And, Lord, still for others this morning, if we're really allowing you to speak to our hearts, you've put a, a person's face in our mind this morning who is doubting, who maybe has gone over, is on the edge in their walk. Or maybe some that we know that have gone over the edge. And you're calling us to be the ones to reach them. To be the one to share the good news of Christ. To help snatch them out of the fire. Lord, whatever it is you're calling us to do, may we be obedient to do it in these moments. Join this church family. Say yes to a call to full-time Christian service. To serve you with all of our lives, for the rest of our lives. So Lord, I pray for any person who needs to make decisions that are calling you, they would do them there in their seat or here at this altar. God, would you move in these moments? We give them to you in Jesus' name. Amen.